as we continue today in our church membership series, based in part on Tom Rainer's book, I Am a Church Member, we're going to talk about the place of family in the church. Now, not literally in pews, obviously, but the importance of family and the vital connection of what it means to be part of God's family, but God's family is made up of families. That is who we are. We all come from families. And together we are God's people, His family. We've talked a lot about the body of Christ, that important metaphor in Scripture of the church. We are the body of Christ. But today we're going to focus on the family, that we are the family of God. Paul uses this analogy throughout his letters. Primarily, we, we see this in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, beginning right off the bat in chapter 1, where we read, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You might have missed the title here. This morning we're talking about what it means to lead our families to be healthy church members. What, what does that mean? How do we do that? And I'm reminded of just how important this is, especially in a day and age when the institution of family is under such heavy attack in our society. The institution of marriage is under heavy attack in our society. Last few weeks, we've been talking about how the church and its leaders are under fire today. The fact that we are in a spiritual battle. If you are a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, that battle is real. If you are taking a stand on the uncompromising truth of God's word and, and being faithful, living out your faith, you're going to be under attack. You will be in the devil's line of fire. That's why Paul writes this, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. This is how, and then he goes into the full armor of God and how we do that, how we put that on and the necessity of that. But you know what's interesting is this passage in Ephesians 6 comes right on the heels of Ephesians 5 where Paul's focus is marriage and family and the church. It's no coincidence. This is important. As I mentioned, families, marriages the way God intended are under fire. In fact, they seem to be in danger of becoming an endangered species today. And that's no coincidence because here's the thing. We mentioned a few weeks ago, if you want to take out the shepherd or sorry, if you want to take out the sheep and scatter them, you take out the shepherd. Jesus said that. And so, you, you, you set your target if you're the devil on church leaders, and I would add all those who are faithful. But how do you get to them? What, what hurts the most? Well, you hit who they love the most. You hit their marriage. You hit their spouse. You hit their children. You hit their family. That's how you hurt the leader. That's how you hurt the shepherd. That's how you hurt the pastor. You start there, and by extension, the church family. This battle is real. Do you, do you know that? Do you agree with that? Have you felt that? We are in a battle. But we're reminded that the battle ultimately belongs to the Lord, and He's equipped us for battle. And today as we talk about what it means to raise families who will be healthy church members, 
man, we're, we're reminded of just how hard it is to raise a family who are healthy people, let alone healthy church members. But we find in God's Word the principles that we need, the truth that we need to live out. And if we stick to what God's Word says, we can be successful by the power of His Holy Spirit. We can do this. It isn't impossible. In fact, God has called us to live not just different lives from this world, but abundantly different lives, lives that are abundant in Christ, which means that when people look at our families as Christians, at our marriages, they should see something radically different. They should see a relationship that is fulfilling, that that is abundant, that is joyful. Not that doesn't have conflict, but that thrives in the midst of it like we talked about last week. A life of abundance in Christ because it's a life in the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit of the living God living inside of us. Amen? Amen? He's there. He's in here. Today I want to talk about what it means to allow Him to have His way. To submit to Him and to surrender to Him because it has important implications. In fact, vital implications for our marriages and for our family and by extension for this church family. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And Laura read this. We, we did this responsive reading. Our responsive read in, reading this morning was taken directly from this passage in Ephesians chapter 5, and it went into Ephesians chapter 6. And as you're turning there, just set this up. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to the church at Ephesus around 60 A.D., an important letter that would have been circulated to all the churches in Asia Minor because it was through the church at Ephesus that they were all founded. In fact, this could have been addressed to any one of them. And the issue that we're going to look at here that was heavy on Paul's heart in writing this letter is the issue of marriage and family, but specifically as those relate to the church and the family of God. Paul uses this picture, this important analogy here, and it's important we understand. And I know we've read it, and it was good to read, but I'm, I'm going to invite my wife, Jennifer, to come on up here, and we're going to read this once again, starting at verse 21 today. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives... Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the Lord is the head of the, of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
Amen. Thank you. Is this passage about the church or about marriage and family? The answer is yes. It's about all of them and how they are connected. The picture that marriage and family and how we operate in marriage and family is to reflect what happens in the church. That is what Paul is talking about here. As he makes clear, I'm talking about Christ in the church, but he is nevertheless talking about marriage and family. And everything in this passage hinges on one, one thing. It's a word that we don't like, some of us. It's a word that we can struggle with. Submission. Submission. That's Paul's focus. That is the principle that every Christian, every believer must follow. Submission. In order for a marriage to function the way God intended, in order for the family to function the way God intended, in order for the church to function the way God intended, we must submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word translated submit is interesting. It's, it's a military term. It means to rank underneath, to get in line behind. So it's a picture of actually fighting to be last in line. Not long ago, I was on a class trip with uh, my son Theodore and, and his class, and we, we got on this bus, and it's crazy. These kids go nuts getting in line to get on the bus, a school bus of all things. But they want to be first, and there was this fight, literally a fight broke out between three of these kids who, who were trying to be first in line, because that's our natural inclination, isn't it? We want to be first. And what Paul has in mind here is, no, 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 you, you want to be last. It's about putting everyone else before you, their needs first. And this is what he has in view when he writes, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, when you come to verse 25, you might think, okay, hold on, husbands, we're off the hook. We don't have to submit. Look, he doesn't use that word. He uses another word. Husbands, love your wives. The word agape means unconditional, sacrificial love, which husbands is like the ultimate submission. That is the ultimate picture. As he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He's talking about sacrificing, the ultimate sacrifice of Christ, laying down his life for the church. That is how, husbands, we are to love our wives. Be ready to and willing to lay down our life for her, to put her needs first, no matter the cost, to be there to support her and bear her burdens and carry her and provide for her. That's the picture here. Okay, great. So then we come down to chapter 6. It's all one thought. And he continues that thought when we read, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And we think, I think we can all get on board with the idea that he's, children should submit to their parents, right, in obedience. That's the point here. But parents aren't off the hook either. Look at verse 4. Fathers, and by the way, that's a, that's a term, broad term that can literally mean parents. So this isn't just for fathers, but parents, do not exasperate. Do not provoke your children to anger. Don't push them over the edge, but instead bring them up in the training, also translated nurture, nurture and admonition or instruction of the Lord. Here's the point in this whole passage, submission for all of us. And again, what's the picture? The picture is ultimately Christ in the church. The church is to submit to Christ, and as we do that, we submit to one another. That's the picture here. Great. Great. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. How come we don't? 
how come this doesn't happen? How come it seems we can't do this? To submit to one another. Why are so many Christians unable to submit to each other in their marriages? In their families? In the church? Why? Because we've missed the key to the whole thing. What I see here is we look at these principles and this is what I need to do and so I'm going to do my best to do it and try hard and, and, and put, it, put in everything I got, all my energy, all my time. I'm, I'm going to go to marriage courses. I'm going to read books. Man, I'm going to do everything I can to make this thing work, to make my family strong. But this thought doesn't begin at verse 21. What we see in verse 21 to 6-4 is based on the principle that we actually find in Ephesians 5-18. If you want to look there. Paul writes, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you see the key to the submission? It's being filled with the Holy Spirit, which requires submitting surrendering to the Holy Spirit. You see, Christians have failed because Christians have failed to be filled with the Spirit. Because Christians try to operate on their own, on their own strength, their own resources, and, and we miss the first and most important principle, which is to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit of the living God who dwells in us. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to have a godly marriage, if you want to raise a godly family and lead them to be healthy members of God's church, then first and foremost, you and I, we must submit to God the Holy Spirit so that we can in turn be filled by him, empowered by him to obey. That is the picture here. And that is the fundamental piece that we need today. It's the filling, empowering of the Holy Spirit of the living God who is in us and he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, which is the only factor that we have going for us. It's the only thing that people will be able to look at in our lives, in our marriages, in our families and say, okay, there's something clearly different here. And it's not just because you're smart or because you've done the marriage courses. It's because God is at the center of your marriage. Christ, his Holy Spirit. You can't have a Christ-centered marriage. You can't have a Christ-centered family if you don't have Christ as the center of your life through the presence and power of His Holy Spirit and submitting to Him and being filled with Him constantly. Now, when it says be filled with the Spirit, it doesn't mean we need more of Him. I believe that every follower of Jesus Christ who genuinely confesses, who repents of their sins and, and confesses to Him, cries out to Him for forgiveness to Christ, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're baptized, we do that. Yes, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit because not every Christian submits because we got this thing called pride. And man, it's a beast. And it needs to be killed. It needs to be crucified. We need to submit that to God and by his Holy Spirit be filled so that we can do what God's word says. 
And I'll tell you what it looks like when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul explains it. Look it. We will speak to one another with psalms. What are psalms? It's the word of God. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's the picture here. It's a parallel passage. We're going to speak God's word, the principles of God's word. We're going to talk about that along with hymns, spiritual songs. You know what's going to happen? We're going to sing and make music in our heart to the Lord. It's a picture of worship, spirit and truth, worship. We're going to be overflowing with thanks for who God is, for what he has done. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. That's a picture to me of of prayer, of constant prayer in the Spirit on all occasions. As Paul writes in Ephesians 6. And how, how do we do this? We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Only as we submit to God, the Holy Spirit, can we do that. And Tom Rainer in his book, I haven't really talked about it at all yet, but, but this is where he lands. He doesn't really address the things I've talked about in the book, but he lands on these two important points for our families, of leading our families to be church members. As spirit-filled church members, we can lead our families to pray together for the church. That's his first point pray together for the church. And, and Rainer gives a little bit of insight into his own experience as a dad as a husband in raising his family. And here's what he says. As our family prayed together for our church, my three sons grew up with a love for the church. They were not blind to the problems and challenges that occur in any church. They did learn, however, to love people unconditionally. And in doing so, they learned to love the church. Part of the opportunity and honor of being a church member is teaching our family to love the church. And that teaching often begins by praying together as a family for the church where God has placed us. Novelist and social critic James Baldwin said this, Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. And it's true. My friends, the question is this, what are our children imitating when they look at us? Specifically, what are they learning about the place, practice, and importance of prayer in our lives, in our marriages, in our families? What are they going to do? What are they absorbing from us? What is the understanding that they have about God? through the way we talk to him. May our children, those in our sphere of influence, see in our lives reliance on prayer, on talking to our Father in heaven, not just daily, but constantly, taking all of our needs to him, praying in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Because we have to, because we need him, because we rely on him. May they see that and do that. And in doing that, may they learn to love the church. May they learn to love Christ and his church that he died for. So I hope and I pray this morning, my friends, that that our children will see parents who pray with and for our spouses with and for them, our children, and with and for our church. Secondly, as spirit-filled church family members, we can lead our families to worship together in the church as we did this morning, as we do every Sunday. What a beautiful picture that is. It's so important. Tom Rainer says this, as a church member, I am responsible for encouraging and leading my entire family to worship together in the church. If I'm married, I seek to include my spouse. If I'm a parent, I seek to include my children. My family must see my love for the church. 
Many church members are single. They have no immediate family with whom they can worship in the church. Regardless, there are still people watching them and how they love the church. They are to be example, an example to others. And I, I just want to say this, because Rainer does address the very challenging situation of a church member who has a family member or family members who are not believers, not part of the church. And of course, this can be especially difficult in the case of a church member with an unbelieving spouse. And here's what he writes, and I appreciate his words here. He says, it can be lonely to be the believer in an unbelieving family. It can likewise be lonely going to worship at your church alone while your spouse remains behind. But God has given such people a mission field, their families, like the missionary who travels thousands of miles to tell the good news to unevangelized people. This church member is to tell the good news in his or her home. A godly spouse can be a key factor in the unbelieving spouse coming to Christ. And that godliness is often demonstrated by the believing spouse's love of the church. I know there's many of us here in that situation. And we pray for you. And we need to pray for one another. For, for the vibrancy of your witness. For perseverance. For strength. Daily. For the power of the Holy Spirit. To be at work in your life. The chapter concludes this way. As a church member, I'm not merely to like my church or serve my church well. I am to fall deeply in love with my church, warts and all. Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. My commitment is to love that bride with an unwavering and unconditional love. And as I grow more deeply in love with my church, I will do all I can in God's power. And I would add, as we submit to and are filled with the Holy Spirit to bring my family with me. We will pray for our church leaders together, we will worship together, and we will serve together. Only, only as we submit our lives, our wills, our minds, our everything to the Holy Spirit in us and are filled with Him, will we be able to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. So may we, the church family of God at Stanley Park Baptist, be spirit-filled Christians who love Christ by loving His church and praying for it. Church members who worship together in spirit and truth with joyful, thankful, overflowing hearts to the Lord, not just on Sunday mornings, through the week. Praising God doesn't mean you have to sing. It means living your life as a sacrifice as, as worship and praise to the Lord, being thankful, giving thanks to God the Father in all things through Jesus Christ. And as the Holy Spirit fills us and leads us, may the example of our lives lead and inspire our families, our children, our spouses, our neighbors, our co-workers to believe in Christ and in turn to submit their lives to Him. There's a pledge that I'm going to ask those who are willing to take. I'm going to read through it so that you can hear what you would be committing to do. And I know some here are, are from other church contexts this morning, and I would invite you to take this pledge with your church in mind, to commit to do these things in your church and for your church with your family. I am a good, sorry, the fifth pledge is I am a church member by the power of the Holy Spirit, I will lead my family to be good members of this church as well. We will pray together for our church. We will worship together in our church. We will serve together in our church. And we will ask Christ to help us fall deeper in love with this church because he gave his life for her. I'm going to ask you to stand. And those who are willing, I, I would ask you to take this pledge with me and follow the PowerPoint uh, because I've added, I think, the important piece, the most important piece, the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do this. Together, let's make this pledge. I am a church member. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I will lead my family to be good members of this church as well. 
We will pray together for our church. We will worship together in our church. We will serve together in our church. And we will ask Christ to help us fall deeper in love with this church because he gave his life for her. Amen. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, God, as, as we say these words, as, as we make this commitment, Heavenly Father, we acknowledge again on our own, in our own strength and resources, we will fail every time. But Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who dwells within those of us who believe. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives, in my life, Lord. I lay it down and ask you to fill it. I give you control. Have your way in my thoughts, through my words, in my actions, so that I would be able to do what your word says, to submit to others, to submit to my wife, to submit to my children, to submit to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ out of reverence for him. Father God, I pray that that you would empower us your people here to live lives that inspire our children, inspire those in our spheres of influence to obey, to ask the question of why. Why are they different? What is different? And want to know the answer. Father God, I pray that you would have your way here at Stanley Park today and tomorrow and in all the days to come, Father God, as we seek to be faithful by submitting to you, surrendering our lives to you, and being filled with your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, I 